Oh, 12. Okay, so hello and welcome to the first HPS presentation series webinar. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, so hello and welcome to the first HPS presentation series webinar. That is very excited to launch this series of thematic webinars, which will showcase the diverse range of projects currently delivered by health partnerships. Hopefully, they will enable UK and overseas partners to get a good sense of the fantastic work currently being delivered by other partnerships across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia and will allow regular shared learning across the HPS um, community. So today, our focus is on surgery and anesthesia. So you should be able to see our screen, which um, has the FET logo and HPS presentation series on it. And you are all currently on mute, so we are not able to hear you at the moment. Um, we'd like to reassure you that the PowerPoint presentation and the recording will be available after today, and we intend to post the recording on our YouTube channel in case you have any problems with connectivity or on seeing slides. Um, we'll have some time for questions at the end, but in the meantime, if you would like to let us know of any problems with the audio, please let us know through the typed questions box, um, and we'll um, try to address any problems. So I'm Laura McPherson, a Grants Officer at FET, and I'm here today to introduce um, today's presentations and to hopefully ensure that the technical side of things runs um, smoothly. So as some of you know, some of you know um, the global burden of disease amenable to surgical intervention is substantial and growing. Thus, the provision of quality surgical and anesthesia care in all countries is of vital importance. Yet, in recent decades, the development of these services has been greatly overlooked, and they are lacking in most low- and middle-income countries. As such, that welcomes the current discourse on and the greater commitments to this issue, um, which we are now starting to see um, across different sectors. Health partnerships are playing an important role in addressing this lack of appropriate surgical and anesthesia care in these countries, uh, particularly through health worker training and education. We will be hearing about the work of three um, very different um, partnerships that we think excel excellently demonstrate the value of this work. So I'd now like to introduce the first um, session for today, um, which we will be delivered by two uh, panelists. Um, firstly, it is uh, Dr. Andrew Ferguson. Um, he is the project coordinator at IDEALS. Um, the charity works in partnership with King's College London and Shifa Hospital in Gaza uh, to deliver the support for the development of trauma care services in Gaza with a particular focus on the newly established limb reconstruction service at Shifa Hospital in Gaza project. Also representing uh, the partnership today um, with Andy um, is Graham Groom, a consultant orthopaedic surgeon at King's College Hospital um, and UK lead for the project. Right, so I will now um, hand you over to them. Hi everybody, it's it's Andy here. Can you all hear me? <clears throat> yes, I can, I can hear you fine. Thank you, Andy. Okay, so thanks, Laura. Um, as Laura has mentioned, I'm a, I'm both trustee of the charity Ideals um, and also health consultant for Medical Aid for Palestinians. I'm accompanied today by Graham Groom, who is also a trustee of Ideals and consultant orthopaedic surgeon within the Limb Reconstruction Service at King's. I think we're all familiar with images such as these from Gaza. And really together with the very high unemployment and poverty levels there, this is why the UN regards the situation in Gaza as an ongoing humanitarian emergency. 
we have a 1.8 million population in a very small geographic area, a typically confusing system of healthcare, a lot of hospitals, but only one, Shifa, with the full range of diagnostic and treatment services to manage major trauma, which itself, as you can see, is a huge problem, both from the conflict, road traffic accidents, and social violence. Until recently, there were no surgical subspecialties in Gaza at all. So all complex limb injuries were referred outside the region. This is causing escalating and non-sustainable costs to the Ministry of Health, massive destruction to families, the quality of service provided is extremely variable, and of course, no proper follow-up. At the heart of our work in Gaza is the charity Ideals, which was established by a fantastic man called John Beavis, orthopedics the surgeon, um, back in 2000, initially to support the amazing work he'd already been doing in war-torn Bosnia. The clinical input has been provided by a pretty incredible group of senior orthopedic, plastic and emergency department consultants from King's augmented on occasion by, uh, uh, by Trust Elsewhere in London and Belfast. Full logistic and security support has been provided by Medical Aid for Palestinians. And they've been working in the Palestinian health sector very effectively and with multiple local partnerships for the past 25 years. Most importantly, of course, our primary partner in Gaza itself has been the Ministry of Health specifically the Human Resources Development Directorate there, uh, and our wonderful colleague, Dr. Nasser Abu Shaban. He and his team are fully responsible for the in-service training of all Ministry of Health staff in the region. This is just a very brief summary of our collaborations with the Ministry of Health. Um, and NGO partners in terms of rehabilitation projects there since 2009. It covers a, a wide range of, uh, of services and interventions, but I think probably PTC, which is primary to trauma care, really sort of launched ourselves there and created a basis for the work that has come since. Uh, PTC is an ATLS equivalent type course, it's free of copyright charges and is now fully recommended by the World Health Organization for use in what they would describe as resource poor environments. And I think introducing a sustainable system of primary trauma care training both within the Ministry of Health and the two medical schools operating in Gaza has really cemented our partnerships there. The PTC work really led to our plans to help establish a new limb reconstruction service in Gaza and to our first step project which began in March 2013. The focal point for that particular project was three observer training fellowships for senior Gazan orthopedic surgeons at Graham's specialist limb reconstruction service at King's. These were designed to be of seven months duration each, but unfortunately, war intervened in July 2014, causing a huge number of casualties and sadly making our project an even greater priority for the region. At that time, I think because of our presence of there and our involvement with that, we were approached by DFID to conduct an emergency health needs assessment, which I think did subsequently inform our own government's aid package and triggered an intensive six month period of intervention in the region. Graham and his colleagues uh, at King's were on monthly surgical team visits to Gaza, working alongside of, uh, their local colleagues, providing joint outpatient clinics, theater sessions, 
post-operative ward rounds, a run of very informative and helpful educational symposia, and within so that, £500,000 worth of emergency equipment and consumables provided to the Ministry of Health in total, but specifically targeting the limb reconstruction service. Here we see some members of that King's team arriving at the Eros Crossing entering into Gaza with just a small proportion of the kit that was provided during that time. We were then lucky enough to secure a second of that grant to continue to support the fledgling service in Gaza, but with an even greater focus on training the full multidisciplinary teams of there. Nurse, theatre technician, physiotherapist, and a plastic surgeon. Also establishing better links with the NGO providers of community-based rehabilitation, and also supporting the introduction of trauma teams at Sheffield Hospital with a program of trauma team member training. This process has been accompanied by greater financial and technical input from Medical Aid for Palestinians, but also a new partner, Norwegian Aid Committee. And I think this is a real key point for us, and that is that FET's support during this time has provided the opportunity to develop stronger partnerships that significantly add to the value and likely impact of our own project. There are some very encouraging signs which have come particularly over the last of six months. We've managed to sign a detailed MOU memorandum of understanding with all partners, including the Ministry of Health, detailing the precise components of, uh, of this project and how this will go forward over the next few years. There's increasingly strong support from senior Ministry of Health directors outside of our initial contact with the Human Resources Department now the wider hospital services uh, and international cooperation departments there. Finally, we have the Limerick Construction Service at Shifa being officially recognized by the Ministry of Health there, with dedicated staff members who won't be moved, uh, as is the norm within the Ministry of Health there, dedicated outpatient clinics and theater sessions, and more recently, the appointment of a coordinator employed by the Ministry of Health but paid for by a collaboration between MAP and Norwag. There are multiple problems, as I'm sure you would imagine, working within this region with the security of issues, the difficulties collaborating with all authorities on both sides of the conflict. But I think a detailed discussion of those probably needs to wait for another day, given our time constraints. So I'll just finish with a slightly different view of, uh, of Gaza, and one which for all of us in the team really provides a fitting conclusion to any working day there. And I'll bring that to a halt. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much, um, Andy, for that presentation. You. Your partnership has, has certainly achieved a lot in the last few years, so I'm surprised you've <laughs> you've managed to uh, summarize it in such a short amount of time. I know we've we've only given you uh, ten minutes, but that was that was really good presentation. Thank you. Um, I would now like to present um, Dr. Isabel Walker, who is a consultant pediatric anaesthetist at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, Isabeau is also Vice President of the Association of Anaesthetists of Great Britain and Ireland <clears throat> and is UK lead for two projects between the, the association, its counterpart in Uganda, the Association of Anesthesiologists of Uganda and the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. Um, she's joined by Alia Ahmed who is the WFSA Programs Manager. So the two projects in paediatrics and obstetrics respectively um, both incorporate the SAFE course, um, SAFE for Anesthesia from Education, and um, they'll be telling us about this uh, now. So I'll hand you over to Isabeau and Alia. Uh, one second.
Great. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks for um, inviting us to present to you today. Um, what I'm going to just talk you through is the various safe projects that we've um, had in um, in East Africa, um, and um, but just I think probably um, it's a very different type of project to the one you've heard about already. Um, but talk through some of our findings and unexpected uh, changes that we came came to. I'm just trying to change my slide. That's it. So a background to the um, SAFE project. I'll talk you through briefly about the SAFE Obstetric Anesthesia Project, SAFE Pediatric Anesthesia Project, and lead you into um, our ongoing projects in East Africa. Um, so the background to the SAFE Obstetric Project, we've got a, a very long-standing link between the Association of Anesthesiologists in Great Britain and Ireland, we're a membership organisation with about 10,000 members, and the Ugandan Society of Anesthesia. Um, at the time when we started working with them, in about 2006, there were 13 physician anesthetists um, and about 300 anesthetic officers. Um, we had an, a, an AGBI member who was working in Uganda, um, and, and it was the, the start of a, of, a, of a link that's now been going for about 10 years or so. Um, we've worked with the Uganda Society initially with conferences, with book donations, with a fellowship program such that there are now about 60 physician anesthetists in Uganda. Um, about 2009, um, we were approached by the WHO to um, start to think about um, improving anesthesia training in, um, in the countries where we were working, CAGBI, and we had a request to um, devise a course to train anesthetists in six weeks. Um, to deliver the essentials of, of anesthesia. And we said, actually, as a, as a profession, that wasn't, wasn't possible, wasn't feasible. Um, but we, what we could do was to devise a refresher course uh, that would deliver high quality training that was relevant to the environment. Um, and so that's how the first um, Safe Obstetric Anesthesia course came about. Um, we approached um, uh, Kate Grady, who's an obstetric anesthetist, who had previously written um, two courses on behalf of other organizations. Um, she gathered around her a team of writers, and we commissioned some videos um, to support the course from Southampton University, um, led by Ollie Ross, who's a pediatric anesthetist. Um, also, to support the, um, the Safe Obstetric course, we commissioned um, publication of, um, of a a little pocket book from Oxford University Press. Um, this is funded by the Association of Anesthetists, by the OAA, the Obstetric Anesthetists Association, and also by the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. Um, I mentioned the WFSA because actually increasingly over time we've become very close partnerships, partners in this work and it's, it's helped us to facilitate the SAFE course. Um, the, the, the course book is a commercially available book but um, through the AGBI and the WFSA we, we buy buy books in bulk and so we're able to donate them at low cost to the course attendees. Um, we applied for some startup funding from, um, from THET um, and it was the British Council at that time to run our first pilot course in Uganda and subsequent to that we applied for a, um, a, a medium sized grant um, and we ran a whole series of courses in Uganda um, all around the country based in different training centres and we were, uh, we were able to um, to train 366 anesthetic officers, um, 32 anesthesiolo anesthesiologists, so the physician anesthetists completed the trainer trainer training which is integral to the course, um, and we did some follow-up. We identified cases where training had, had made an impact. Um, we uh, linked with another organization, um, Lifebox, which is uh, concentrating on delivery of oximetry and monitoring for patients, and we were able to uh, um, deliver oximeters to each individual anesthesiologist and anesthetic officer who didn't have access to an oximeter. And in that way, uh, we hoped we were having a, a quite an impact on patient safety. Um, the actual key um, to this project were the people involved. Um, the top we have Stephen Tender, who was the then president of the Uganda Society of Anesthesiologists, and he was our key key link. He, he was the person who, who, who we, um, we relied on to um, link out to anesthetic officers and actually within country he was a, a, um, a focal, focal point for, um, I think everybody has his mobile number in their phones and he, they, everybody asks him for 
for help when needed. Um, we also were working with two young enthusiastic lecturers, one in uh, Umbarara, um, Joseph Chirinuka, and other, um, Andrew Chintu, uh, based in, in uh, Kampala. And these two um, young anesthesiologists who had also been through the AGBI fellowship program um, became the leaders for the Safe Obstetric Project um, in Uganda. Um, David Snell was a, um, a long-term volunteer in Uganda. He spent a year in Uganda. Maitani, a six-month volunteer in Uganda. And they were our key UK people um, who um, helped to deliver these courses um, on a regular basis. So, and they, they became very close working partners. Um, after completion of a, of a round of safe obstetric anesthesia training, we thought actually we'll move on to another um, need in, in Uganda, which is pediatric anesthesia. Um, we weren't quite sure with pediatric anesthesia what we should be teaching. Um, we were anxious that we were going to um, have a model of care that was familiar to us but not relevant to the local situation. So we um, looked back at a, a survey that we'd um, undertaken in Uganda where we'd, we'd sent um, a um, happened to be a medical student from the States with one of the anaesthetic registrars from Uganda and they visited a whole series of hospitals in one region of the country and took a snapshot to see what, what actually was going on and that unsurprisingly very limited surgery was being undertaken mainly trauma related and um, late presentation obviously very common referrals common so we knew we had to build that into any training program, how do you refer a patient safely? And also very important for us, in theatre mortality was low. The anaesthetic techniques that were being used were, were very much ketamine based, very simple. And it was at our peril that we changed those anaesthetic techniques because actually weren't going to improve safety for patients. Um, so then we, um, we undertook to write the safe paediatric course. We identified two editors, myself and a colleague, Michelle White, who's a paediatric anaesthetist working with nurseships. We again, we gathered a team of writers around us, and again, commissioned Southampton University to, um, to do some videos for us, and we wrote a course book. Um, this was published through the World Federation um, as a special edition of um, Update and Anesthesia um, um, and Addressing Pediatric Anesthesia in Critical Care. Um, it's available as a PDF, and actually for us it's a much cheaper way to distribute because we have all the copyright controls of it. Um, but we've also got a print run which we deliver with the safe course. The safe course format, um, we recognize that we are dealing with adult learners. Um, our teaching is all based around case scenarios. It's very interactive, we try and get a, a role play going as much as possible and really minimize lectures. When we first started going to Uganda, the pattern of learning was very much the old style classroom, um, the teacher at the front and people taking notes in large classes of 100 people. Um, we've, we've stopped all of that. Um, we have multiple breakout sessions um, and we use um, whiteboards, videos and, and mannequins however we can. Um, just some, a couple of images of the, of the um, small group teaching, um, uh, low fidelity simulation but actually surprisingly effective and, and I think candidates, those who've done uh, simulation will, will recognize that anxiety when you're, when you're dealing with scenarios. Um, one of the huge benefits from the SAFE format has been the anesthesiologist teaching the anesthetic officers. Um, and it's been a very powerful learning experience, I think, on, on many sides. And um, there's no doubt that it, it works extremely well. One of the things we also did was to run an essay competition with each course. And at the end of the first day of the course, we asked the anesthetic officers to write a, a short essay. Uh, tell me about a case where the patient survived unexpectedly or a case that you'll never forget. Or, that we, have, we have a series of essay titles um, and actually that was a huge benefit for, um, for all of us. It was, a, it was a great insight for us as trainers from overseas to understand the sit situation that the anaesthetic officers were working in, but also for the anesthesiologists who all work in urban centres. They were starting to read what, about what it was like for their counterparts, the anaesthetic officers, working in very, very remote areas. Um, the course is, uh, was molded was, as we undertook it. We had faculty meetings every day. We tweaked and, and changed the course as, as required. Um, some of the things that came out of, the, of those faculty meetings was um, people need to know drug doses and they need to have them available with them. So again, the WFSA and the AGBI commissioned um, and published a small little booklet, um, which is the Safe Obstetric Anesthesia and Drug Doses booklet. Um, and uh, we, we send those out for every participant who's running a course, who's, who's taking part in a course. 
Um, train the trainers has been absolutely integral to the whole program. Um, each um, SAFE course is um, accompanied by a train the trainer course. Um, and we've also um, run a train the trainer course, the same format, um, in the UK. And this is to just get UK trainers up to speed on, obviously, how to teach, but also the ethos of the SAFE course and the content and the situation in which they, they would be going to work in. Um, and we found that this is it's actually been quite a, a useful thing to do. We have lots of people who approach us who want to do um, some volunteering, but equally we want to make sure they volunteer in, appropriate, in an appropriate manner. We assess all the courses. Um, we've used a Kirkpatrick model, which is, I think, the basic educational model, um, both before the course, uh, both immediately on the day of the course, and then we, uh, we, we try and undertake some, some follow-up as well. The, the sort of more difficult areas are change in behavior and change of outcome, institutional change, um, which is difficult to capture, I must say. And this is the type of thing that we, that we collect. Um, we've got the... Um, MCQs and skills we assess before the start of the course and after the course and then send safe volunteers um, around to do some follow-up three to six months later. Now what we've been, been done in the past has been very opportunistic and we've identified UK volunteers who are in country um, and we've asked them to go and do the follow-up on our behalf and that's worked, worked well. The type of things that we're finding in terms of change behavior um, are comments people are making and examples um, the sort of thing we, uh, we get back or we used not to give painkillers. We've now given people a structure on how to give analgesia to children. We've given them safe booklets so now you can look information up. Um, and things that used to really irritate us like ventilation for, for newborn babies, we're starting to get the message across. It's not all about suction. Um, I think for the it, there's some very insightful comments we've had back from the clinical offices. Um, I think in terms of um, the small group teaching, having the advocacy, having people sitting together who don't normally you normally work very um, isolated on their own, um, they suddenly see that actually they need to start to start to think about themselves, uh, things themselves. It's not good enough to say I ran out of, I don't have. Um, we have anaesthetic officers telling other anaesthetic officers, you must go and speak to your superintendent, you need option to give anaesthesia. And they're starting to uh, start to, to start to solve their own problems, which is good. Um, we've introduced new concepts such as teamwork. Um, you, you, work to, you work together and you treat better, patients better if you're not alone. Um, and actually, this is a huge benefit, I think, that I was unexpected. Um, this is a comment from one of the anesthesiologists in Uganda. We won't learn what it's like to work in the health center falls, which are the most basic health units we used to criticize, and now we understand. And what we found is that the anesthesiologists, the young anesthesiologists coming through training, are now enormous advocates for their colleagues um, out in the rural districts. And I think this is very important for the strength of anesthesia in Uganda ongoing. And just to finish up then, just to talk about our ongoing projects um, in East Africa. Um, this is a, the, the uh, most recent grant we've obtained from, from THET. Um, and the two main projects, one is Safe Pediatric Anesthesia in East Africa, the other one is Safe Obstetric Anesthesia in Kenya. Um, and what we've done is build on existing links. So we have very strong links with the AGBI. The um, Uganda Society of Anesthesia is now morphed into the Association of Anesthesiologists as they've got more doctors. We're, we're, we're aware of other pre-existing links with other, other um, countries. So in Scotland, there's a Scotland-Malawi link, there's a UK-Zambia link, the Kent, Surrey, Sussex, Denia, the Adenary has a link to Ethiopia, um, and there's a WSA Pediatric Fellowship based in Nairobi in Kenya. Um, and what we wanted to do was to disseminate the SAFE course through these links, um, and what we're doing in January is inviting representatives from all of those links to meet in, um, in Uganda and to, uh, to partake in the course and then to be trained as faculty and then to run a course themselves and then we funded as part of the project um, um, them to run the course back home and then then handing that link, handing the course to the link, the pre-existing link to, to carry on running the courses in the different countries and in that way I think we're going to disseminate the course in a fairly strategic way um, and hopefully maintain the quality. Um, we've rather than relying on um, on ad hoc follow up for the course, we decided that we would appoint a safe pediatric anesthesia fellow, and this would um, give um, young clinicians an opportunity to gain some some specialist pediatric anesthesia experience in um, in 
a low-income country, so both Nairobi and, and also in Blantyre, and also to undertake, undertake the course follow-up. Um, and uh, so that, I think, will work well. It's a new innovation for us. So for obstetric anesthesia, of course, um, in Kenya, we're approached by the Kenyan Society. Um, we've done some work with the Kenyan Society with Lifebox, with distribution of oximeters, and they said we want to run the safe course. Um, also, there's a very strong link in East Africa, obviously, the neighboring countries between the Kenyan Society and the Association of Anesthesiologists of Uganda. They've been very mutually supportive. And so what we're using is the Ugandan faculty to help run the, the course in Kenya um, and then to disseminate the obstetric course um, through the different regions in Kenya. Again, we've appointed a SAFE fellow. He'll be based in Nairobi, a UK clinician. He'll gain some invaluable experience in obstetric anesthesia and will also help to run the courses and do the follow-up and to help build an anesthesia network in, in Kenya, much the same as has happened in, in Uganda. I think that's where I'll, I'll finish. Um, our aim was to de deliver a high quality training that was relevant to local needs. We're hoping that we're doing that. Um, but also I think one of our main aims is to um, really encourage partnerships to get people to work together and to build links wherever possible. And I think we're hoping to do that. We're, we've, I think on reflection we, we are doing that at every level really through national organizations, through partnerships between different countries um, and through the World Federation and the Association of and it's easier uh, at the AGBI in the UK as well. So I'll finish there. Great, thank you very much, uh, Isabeau, for, for your presentation. Um, again, <laughs> so much to cover in such a short amount of time, but it was really good to hear about the SAFE course and how that's going, as well as the how. Your, your experience of the training of trainers um, as, as part of, of rolling out those courses in those countries. Um, so our last presenter today is um, Stuart Watson, who will be presenting to us on the work of the Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS Trust and Corlebu Hospital in Accra's current project um, titled the Accra Burn Centre Project, or the ABC Project. Um, Stuart is a consultant plastic surgeon at the Canis Burn Unit in Glasgow. Um, Stuart sits on the International Society for Burns Injuries Guidelines Development Committee and for this project leads guideline and clinical governance development. Um, so I'll now hand you over to him. Yeah. Um. I'm a burn surgeon from Glasgow and we're working in partnership with the burns unit in Accra in Ghana. The thing that we're trying to prevent and the people that we're trying to help are the countless thousands of young people in developing countries who sustain burns and get inadequate treatment and end up with devastating contractures, disability and social devastation to their futures. So that's the point of trying to improve treatment for burn injuries. There's a background to this, which is the World Health Organization issued a plan in 2008 on burn prevention and care for low and middle income countries. They described burns as the forgotten global health crisis affecting a huge number of people. And they identified now well-known fact that 95% of people with burns requiring medical attention live in relatively poor countries and that a very large proportion of those are children and if they had an inadequate treatment then it destroys their futures and also many people die unnecessarily because of poor burn treatment. Another notable fact is that as development occurs so the incidence of burn injuries is significantly reduced in rich countries and the incidence is steadily increasing in many poor countries as the process of social development and industrial development occurs. Why are burns more common in poor countries? Well, traditionally, young people and children are very high risk from, tradi from traditional cooking methods in, in poor countries. Also, as modern innovations such as electricity are introduced, standards of safety are very, very poor. 
traditional lighting has been very vulnerable to causing fires. And a recent issue which is well identified throughout Africa is that recycled cheap faulty gas cylinders from rich countries are being sold in Africa and resulting in many accidental and horrific burns from gas explosions because they are these devices are faulty. So there's a high incidence of burns and they're often very severe in low and middle income countries. Here on the contrary is a study which we did from Glasgow with the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Malawi which showed the tiny number of staff who are available for treating burns in your typical low income country burns unit. On the left the number of surgeons, the number of nurses, the number of physiotherapists in Blantyre. On the right similar available staff in Glasgow. So we're looking at a huge divide in the scale of the health problem and also a huge divide on the contrary in the facilities and staff available to treat them. So there's a long history between Glasgow and Cordoba Hospital in Accra of cooperation. And this is me outside the burn center there which was developed as a result of cooperation with Glasgow. And beside me is Apoko Ampoma who is our African lead for this project and he's in the head of that burn center and he's a fantastic surgeon and leader who has brought the unit there forward tremendously since he started there eight years ago. The history of this project is tied up with a charity called Research Africa which is a renamed charity which was established 25 years ago and it's established because of the work of the man on the right who is Jack Mustardi, one of my predecessors in Glasgow and his meeting at a cocktail party at the embassy in Accra and Ghana with um, then president, previously flight lieutenant Jerry Rollins, who was a very charismatic leader of Ghana. And the two of them met and it famously Jack said to the president, you need a, a Burns and Plastics unit and the president said go ahead and make one and he did. So that's the unit that then followed. The current Burns unit is extremely overcrowded. I'm sorry this is a slide from Bangladesh but um, I don't have one of the Burns unit interior in Accra, but it's extremely overcrowded. So Poku Ampoma over the last few years has put in a huge amount of work into developing a new burn center. And this, this building actually wasn't purpose built. Um, people who work in the health service will be familiar with it. This was a nice looking building. It was initially going to be an office block. But he's managed to get the hospital there to change it into a burn center and to have a ICU, HDU and purpose-built theater. But what concerned Apoku about opening this new center which is just about to open was how he could actually run it with appropriate staff. And I just want to now bring in some other members of our partnership through the map of the British Isles. We're in Glasgow and we have other partners in Scotland. The star in, in Ireland is in Dublin and our, one of our lead partners is in Dublin. But a key partner who have become more and more important as our project has taken off have been the Interburns charity led by Tom Potticar, a surgeon from Swansea in Wales. And this charity has done a huge amount of work on education in low and middle income countries for burn care, also on prevention and various other aspects in the last 10 years. And one of the key things that they've Produced is a set of standards for burn services in low middle income countries and a method of using those standards to analyze the way a service is delivering care. So just over a year ago, um, Apoku and Poma got John Potikar's team from Interburns to visit his unit and do an assessment of the unit. And they produced a, a stark and honest assessment which identified some key issues about nursing, which I think, I think to be honest, the surgeons there knew about. But what they identified was that over the last 25 years, there's been tremendous development of professionalism and a good work ethic and self-respect and skills in the surgical and anesthetic teams there. But that nursing, particularly in the wards, has lagged far behind that. And that there is a deficiency of number of nurses of professionalism and of morale. 
Another major deficiency with, that was found was a lack of clinical guidelines so that treatment was often ad hoc and very, very um, varying in quality. So we decided to try and do something about this and we approached SETS for support and we were very pleased to receive their support. And I was interested um, to digress slightly, Andrew's um, talk about Gaza, he identified that that has enabled them to develop new partnerships and I would, I would emphasize that's been one key advantage of this project is that we have developed several important new partnerships which have been very useful and, and, and very, very interesting. So the first new partnership that we developed, if you look at this little map of Africa, the star above is obviously Ghana and in West Africa. And we approached a surgeon called Adeline Maganza, who's the lead surgeon in the huge Baragana um, Hospital burns unit in Soweto in South Africa. And they have a marvelous burns unit there. And we approached him because we felt that if we sent nurses there to get additional training, that they would train, receive training that was far more intense and far more specific to Africa than anything that we could provide here. So part of the project, the first part of the project, is that several nurses are going there to receive specialist training to improve the standards of nursing professionalism and skills in the new burn centre. So that's Dr. McGanza there. And in the near future, several of the staff are going off to work there. Second major aspect to our work is in running burn injury courses. And we um, have used the inter-burns model for courses. And again, to digress, uh, I, I was really um, taken with ex exactly what Isabeau said in her talk about their work in Uganda and also in Kenya of trying to run courses with an emphasis on uh, participation, small group discussions, and using a local faculty. And that's the model which Interburns have developed, and we've adopted that model. And here you see Tony Ling, one of the senior surgeons of the local unit, uh, participating in the course. And as far as possible, we, we use a local faculty, and we avoid um, lectures and run small group discussions and interactive sessions instead. So here's a recent group who were there. And one encouraging development, just to the right of center, are several of the nurses who came to the, this course from Sierra Leone. And the, the burns and plastic service there has been utterly devastated by the Ebola crisis, but they are now able to travel and they're now able to rebuild their service. So already a, a, a new small partnership which is developing in the course of this project is, is with the service in Sierra Leone. Third major part of, of the project is that in our own department in Glasgow, there about eight years ago, there were several of our experienced burns nurses and plastic surgery nurses to initiated and developed a, a specialist graduate certificate course for nurses in burns and plastic surgery nursing. And what we've done is we've involved them in designing the project, um, we co-opted them onto the steering group, and they are going to work with the Ministry of Health and the Nursing Education Department at Colibou University in Accra to develop a similar project there, so that not only are we running ad hoc burns courses, we're also going to try and develop a specialist diploma. And we have strong support from the Ghana Ministry of Health in that respect. And one very encouraging development about the first essential burn care interburns course which we ran was that this lady attended at um, interburns behest, and she is the lead nurse educator from the um, Burn Center and Burns Plastic Surgery Center in Addis Ababa. Her name's Nigat Waldemahariat. And she is now going to be involved in our project. So we're, we're happy to find that we now have a, a third um, partner in Africa delivering both um, specific education for from the African environment and also more as importantly specific nursing education rather than education predominantly being delivered by surgeons. Finally, the last aspect of our project is in developing clinical guidelines to be implemented in the hospital in, in Accra. And I'm on the International Society for Burn Injuries Executive Council and, and part of the, 
of the, my involvement in that is that we're developing a set of clinical guidelines for specifically for low and middle income countries. So the idea is that the guidelines should be applicable everywhere, and th those guidelines should be issued by August this year. So we're hoping to essentially adapt those guidelines slightly for for use in the burns unit in in Accra. And a further development when we ran that essential burn care course is that many of the other staff who came to that course from Kamasi, the other major hospital, and several of the other smaller cities elsewhere in Ghana um, showed a enthusiasm for our hopes to implement these guidelines elsewhere in Ghana. Just in summary, as, as other speakers have said, one of the major factors that's been a great advantage to us about getting FET support for this project is that we've added multiple new partners to previous cooperations that we had with our partners there. And we're hoping to use these multiple partners to develop burn education care in West Africa and, and possibly in other parts of Africa as well. So many thanks for your attention and thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart, for your presentation. It was very interesting and it was an emotive presentation. Um, and I think I'm, oh, I think I'm not on mute. That's good. Um, and I'm very excited to hear about how that new course um, goes as well in in Accra later on. Um, I think we've heard numerous examples today of what we consider at FET to be. Uh, the principles of partnership, um, or what we call more informally um, at FED, the POPs, um, and how um, these are translating into success um, for partnerships and their projects. Um, so just um, if, you know, to pick out some, some examples of, from, from what we've heard today, um, partnerships um, are managing to be successful through working with with multiple partners, as, as both Stuart and and uh, I think Andy pointed out, working and aligning with Ministry of Health, um, working long term with partners in country, um, multidisciplinary training, co considering the entire um, uh, trauma pathway, as we as we heard, um, and similar, um, particularly in Stuart's presentation um, in Accra. Um, the use of multiple learning formats, um, etc. So um, you can read a bit more about um, the principles of partnership on our website, um, but I've just put them up here. So there are eight um, principles of partnership. Um, so they're strategic, harmonized and aligned, effective and sustainable, um, respectful and, and reciprocal, organized and accountable, responsible, flexible, resourceful and innovative, and committed to joint learning. And um, so there are some case studies that you can have a look at to, to, to see more about the, the eight uh, principles um, on our website, so do, do, visit, do visit it there. Um, we're also starting to blog about um, issues related to these eight principles, um, and we, we are trying to make them Come more more alive and, and not be too dry and boring. So please do keep an eye on our blog page um, to to read up about what partnerships are doing um, at the moment to um, with within the umbrella of those of those eight um, principles. Um, I thought it would um, be very um, useful to point you to the new. Africa Grants Program, if you've not already heard about it, um, we are, will be managing this on behalf of Johnson & Johnson, um, and there will be two grant streams open. Um, application deadline is uh, Sunday the 7th of February. Um, the two uh, grant streams are surgical and anaesthetic care and community health care, and I, do, I am aware that some um, of the participants today um, will be um, interested also in that in that second uh, category of funding. Um, there's a lot of information on our website. Um, at that link below, you can you can get to the information and to the application forms um, on our news page. Um, so so I guess if anyone does have any questions about that at the end, we'll be, um, we can try and answer those as well. Um, there will be a webinar next week, um, telling you more about the application process and 
um, what we'd be looking for in your application forms, um, and that's a week today, um, again at 12 o'clock. Okay, um, so now that we've come to the end of the presentations, um, we can start to take um, some questions, although I know it's, it's we've got about maybe just less than 10 minutes um, to do so. So if you do have any questions, um, you can either type them into the questions box on the panel on the right-hand side of your page, um, or you can click the little yellow hand button that should be showing next to your name, and you can ask the question, and we will unmute you and um, and, and answer the questions for you. Um, so we'll just have a look to see if there are any questions coming through. I don't think there are. There is there is one comment, I think. Um, brilliant presentation and very impressive. Uh, have you engaged with the FET-sponsored Change Exchange Program to enhance your assessment of behaviour change? I'm just going to um, unmute the, the panellists because I think they are still on mute. Apologies. Um, simple answer from from uh, from the AGBI is no. I'd be interested to find out more. Uh, great, as uh, I can, I can uh, on that um, as well. Um, the that comment uh, came from I think uh, Jed. Um, yes, Isabel, I can I can provide you some information about that. Um, the University of Manchester have, have started um, as of this month a new twelve month project. Um, looking to support partnerships um, around behaviour change uh, techniques and theories. So um, I can put you in touch with them if you would like to, to find out more about that. Great. Great. Did, did I think maybe another panellist had a comment there? Okay. Um, and Laura, if, it, if there's time, and there was a question that I was quite interested to ask some of the other panellists. Yes, okay. Time. So, I mean, what the FET grant has done for kind of this project for us is it's given us the chance to, you know, as Isabel spoke, finesse it and kind of hone it into a product that we're quite happy with. And what the what this round of debt funding has meant is that we can scale that up. And I wondered if, if for the other projects, so all safe pediatric training, from going from training in Uganda, it will now happen in Uganda, Ethiopia, Kenya, Zambia, Malawi. So, you know, a huge scale up that this set funding has given us the opportunity to do and I wondered I know um, with the Burns unit that um, Stuart talked about maybe moving it to other countries I wondered if you had an idea of which other countries that would be and the same with the Gaza project I know that works differently so I I don't you know it's not the same context in other countries but I wondered if there was ideas of scaling up maybe in other hospitals in the West Bank or other hospitals in Gaza Andrew, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Thanks. Um, you're right, really, because it, it's quite a unique sort of context in Gaza. I think in terms of taking the same model elsewhere, <clears throat> wouldn't be so particularly successful. But what is happening, and because of our, the ongoing partnerships there and the fact of our presence uh, and ability to, to go and meet people on a regular basis during sort of our visits and stay in communication with them in between those visits, is that there are <clears throat> further collaborations now taking place with the Ministry, Medical Aid for Palestinians, uh, ourselves, and the Norwegian Aid Committee looking at neurosurgical services alongside of this. Again, the link with the trauma, the intensive care unit services, sort of at Chief Hospital, which is the only dedicated major trauma centre within the region at the moment. Um, we're also looking, because of problems that we've had with equipment, which Graham may sort of expand upon sort of at, a, at a later time. Uh, looking to do some emergency repair work uh, and longer term development work with sterilization services within the main hospitals in Gaza as well. So it's not so much a scaling up of the same project elsewhere, but an expanding into other areas within the same area. Okay, thank you. <laughs> may, I, may I make a comment, Laura? It's Graham Green speaking. Yes, yes of course, Graham. Um, so 
Thank you very much to all three speakers. I thought it was extremely interesting and was very pleased to be part of it. I, I think our, our, our uh, emphasis on the, the business of partnerships is that we've been able to start very small and we've been able to expand what we do in a location, in just in Gaza. I don't think, as Andy says, that it would be very easy to transfer what we have done else, elsewhere without, um, without a completely new beginning. But the benefit for us of the partnerships is that the overall effect is far greater than the sum of the parts now that we are not only in partnership with the Human Resources Development Directorate, with the local uh, authorities, but we're in partnership with two more very large charities. And the THEC grant, this is our second THEC grant, has, has really made that possible. And it's, uh, it's hugely rewarding to see the way to, to see the way the project is growing and developing. We, we started by teaching, and we started after the conflict. The visitors were the ones doing the operating, assisted by the locals. And now, the locals are doing the operating, and the visitors are assisting. And that is such a rewarding development from, um, from, from our perspective. Sorry, that's rather a long comment, but thank you. No, <laughs> thank you. Um, does anyone else have any final comments? Very briefly, just to agree with Isabel about that. It, for us, it's it, it's something where we've had offers and interest in Sierra Leone and Ethiopia, and it's also considerably helped us with a, another project that I'm involved in in Malawi, where um, it's helped us to enhance the quality of nursing education for that project, and. In addition, one of our volunteers was recently asked at the last minute to join a project in, in Bangladesh for de developing advanced um, burn care education there and, and delivering it. So it seems to be opening up all sorts of possibilities. And, and I would echo what, what both Isabel and Andrew have said, really, that it, it, it seems to um, just open so many possible avenues um, having this support. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, yeah, Isabel. I, I just had one one quick um, uh, question, really. Um, we we often find uh, when we're working in the operating theatre that the the team, and I think one of the other speakers alluded to this, the team that's neglected are the nursing staff. Um, and I wondered if there was um, an opportunity for actually all the partnerships to get together to work with nurses to talk about developing um, a, um, standards guidelines for um, operating room work, work, if you like, as a safe operating core, um, because I think it's an area that's somewhat neglected and the professionalism within the nursing would be great to encourage that. I'd be great, I'd be yeah. very pleased to get in touch with you about that, I'd be very interested. Perfect. <laughs> More partnerships happening. <laughs> <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> great, I think, I think oh. you've, all, I've, you've all been copied into the, to the email, so I you all have your con each other's contact details, so that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Well, um, if anyone does have any uh, feedback to provide on the session following today, please um, do um, provide that to me, as well as any ideas that you may have for future webinars um, in this series. So our next webinar will focus on um, projects implemented in Uganda. Um, and will be held on the 15th of March. Um, so we do hope you can join us um, for that one too. Um, so thank you very much for registering um, for our webinar today. We do hope um, it's been of interest to you and, and you think this is a worthwhile thing for us to, to continue um, facilitating. Um, and of course, thank you very much to um, our presenters. So Andrew, Graham, John, Isabeau, Alia, and Stuart. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.